So far throughout this series, we've looked at two themes of Advent so far, the the theme of promise and the theme of hope. And as we've said several times today, our current theme, our theme for this morning is that of love. If you are new to this church thing or maybe your religious tradition in the past, it didn't celebrate Advent. Advent simply means coming, expectation, anticipation of an arrival. Advent season, it should bring into our minds these ideas of promise, hope, and expectation. It's a reminder of us that our King, King Jesus, he has come, but he is also coming again. Listen, that is our hope. That is our expectation, church. Our longing for our King to come again. So throughout this series, we've looked at Jesus' coming in in the form of a human, right? Human and, and, and born of the Virgin Mary, born for the purpose of redeeming lost sinners. But also this series, it has a kind of this flavor of looking forward to the second coming of Christ, where Christ will return and he will institute his everlasting peaceful reign here on earth, where he will reverse the curse and he'll make all things new. That is what we long for, isn't it, church? That Christ would return, he would gather his church together and we will be with him forever in paradise. That's what we long for. But until that day comes, we are waiting, waiting for that arrival whereby each and every day we are submitting ourselves to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, where we're being shaped and molded and conformed into the image of Jesus, where we are embracing day after day the promises of God, living with assurance of the certain hope that we have in Christ Jesus. And my prayer for us today is that while we are in the waiting, waiting for our King to return, that we would be a people marked by the incredible love of God in our lives. So this morning, as we've already read the scripture, I wanna invite you to, to take out your Bibles, turn them on, find John, or excuse me, 1 John chapter four. 1 John chapter four, not the gospel of John, but rather the little book of 1 John. It'll be found in the very back of your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible with you, you don't have one downloaded on your, on your device, I just wanna invite you to take out that blue hardback copy of the Bible out in the chair in front of you. We'll be on page 1,023. Page 1,023. You know, the Christmas season, it's a, it's a time when we begin to think about gifts, isn't it? Apparently, from all the commercials and all the TV shows, we are inundated with this idea that Christmas is coming, and because Christmas is coming, that's the time when we give and receive gifts. And I don't know if you've caught it from all the commercials, but apparently these gifts are supposed to be extravagant gifts, right? Somebody's getting a Lexus this Christmas, right? Chelsea's getting me a new truck, right? Somebody's going to Jared, and quite often, right? It's a time when we think about gifts, And what am I going to get my wife this year? What am I going to get my kids? And dads, listen, don't be that guy that is just as surprised on Christmas morning to find out what you got your kids as your kids are, right? Put a little time and effort into it, right? Get them something nice. Think about it. This morning, we are going to be talking about the cliche. The greatest gift imaginable is the son of God, right? We use that all the time. The greatest gift given to us is the incredible gift of God's love, And if I'm honest with you this morning, this is really difficult for me to try to explain it adequately. It is so large, so vast that I I don't feel like I'm going to do it justice this morning. But the love of God, it's what this Christmas season is all about. So let's look at the scriptures this morning. 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 7, and let's look at the love of God. It says this, Beloved, Let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God, and he knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this love, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. As we just read those verses, it's quite clear that the content is that of of love. But if we're really gonna press into love this morning, if we're gonna understand the love of God in which he has loved us with, then I think we need to take a step back and understand how John is using that word love in the text. 
You see, when we come to church and we come to the believers that make up the church, we would all agree that love is one of the most important defining characteristics and attributes of the Christian. We know, reading throughout the New Testament, that if the one thing that we will be marked by as believers in Christ is our unique love for God that results in our love for others. I doubt that anybody in this room would say, love, eh, it's not really that important. I don't think we should be a loving people. I think that the world would be just a better place without love. No, 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 we would all agree from our own experiences in life, if the world could use a little bit more love, it would be a good thing, wouldn't it? See, we know that we ought to be loving. We know that our, our world, it needs to be loved, but it seems like there's a disconnect there. It seems like our world, our culture that we're living in right now is asking a question, what is love? Is love, is it just a feeling? Is love, is it just an emotion? Is love really just reduced down to a chemical reaction taking place in the brain at a time? Our culture, our society, we are all asking the question, what is love? love? This makes you want to dance, doesn't it? That's frowned upon in the Baptist church, though. We've been there before together. Listen, let's, let's ask that question. What, what is love? And I believe only when we are able to take a step back for a moment press into the scriptures that we will get an incredibly different view of what love is. In other words, what I'm trying to say is the way that God talks about love in his scriptures is vastly different than how you and I typically love one another. You see, the way that you and I typically love and use the word love and define love, we do so in terms of enjoyment, For example, when I say, I love, fill in the blank, I love my wife, I love my kids, I love sports, I love being in the outdoors, I love a good steak. What I'm doing there, when I'm using those words like that, I'm doing so in terms of enjoyment, in terms of pleasure, in terms of satisfaction. I enjoy being in the outdoors. I enjoy a good steak. I enjoy good quality time with my family. But when God describes love throughout his scriptures, he doesn't define it in terms of feeling. He doesn't define it in terms of emotion. No, no, those are far too simplistic. They're far too self-centered and self-serving. When God describes the love in the Bible, he always does so in terms of giving yourself away to another. What is love? It is giving yourself away to another. That's what the love in this text, it means. John uses this word love, agape love, 30 times in a span of just 24 verses. He's trying to get our attention. For us that we've grown up in church for quite some time, we know agape love. It's been said that agape love, it's unconditional love, isn't it? And while I believe like, yeah, sure, that's true, there may be a deeper, more impactful definition that John is trying to, to press into the text here. See, I believe that correctly understood, agape love, it is a self-sacrificing love. It is a love that is granted to someone that needs to be loved. Not necessarily someone that is attractive or even lovable. In other words, the love that we're dealing with this morning is a love that seeks the best for others, even at great cost and personal expense to oneself. Love, it is love that seeks the best for others, even at great cost and personal expense to oneself. So that is our foundation this morning. That is our our launching point. As we walk through the text this morning, we're going to see God loving us in this way. And because we have been loved this way, we ought to love others in the same way and in the same extent as God has loved us. Verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God. Why? Because God is love. The first thing I think we see in the text is this. Love has its source in God. Love has its source in God. We're gonna focus on just those last three words in verse eight, that God is love. John says, God is love. 
Now, that's an astonishing thing to consider, isn't it? Think about that for a moment. This is just one of the handful of times in all of Scripture where the biblical writers will connect God directly to one of his attributes. We see other places in Scripture that God is spirit, that God is light, that God is true, that God is a consuming fire. Only a handful of times in the whole canon of Scripture will the biblical writers connect God directly to one of his attributes. And here John says what? God is love. He doesn't say that God is loving, but rather that he is love. It does not mean that love is his only attribute or characteristic. It doesn't mean that all love or, or love is God. What John is showing us here is at the core of who God is, catch this, at the core of who God is, is love. This means if we're asking the question, what is love? Then we can know the answer by looking into the scriptures, pressing into the scriptures, seeing who God is and how he works in this world. If you want to know what love is, look to the scriptures and the God of scriptures and see how he interacts with human beings here in this world. The text is saying that the source of love is not found within us. It's not found within sinful, fallen human beings. No, but rather it is found in the God of the scriptures that love has its source in God. And the crazy thing about this entire concept that God is love, it's painting us this picture almost of love overflowing from who God is and it's being poured out onto us. And may I suggest to us this morning that this is a fundamentally different way of how you and I love others. Think about it for a moment. You and I, we typically love others because we found something, some characteristic, some attribute that we find attractive. I love somebody because I think they're attractive. I think they are, I like their looks. I like their income. I like their intelligence. I like their personality. The source of love isn't found in me, but rather it's found in them. They are compelling me to love them because of who they are. This is the default method by which humanity loves. Our love for others is not sourced in us, but rather other people. But catch this, John is saying that is not how God loves. It's fundamentally different of how God loves. You see, God did not love us because we were lovable. We're going to press in here a little bit. God does not love you. He does not love me because he sees down into our road and says, man, you're lovable. Uh, You're compelling me to love you right now. No, 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 the scripture, it paints a completely different picture. It really shows us that we weren't lovable at all, that there was nothing within us that compels God to love us. No amount of good morals, no amount of good effort, no amount of good possible um, outcomes in your life, no amount of beauty or physical resources where God was moved to compel you to compel to love you, I should say. And if we were honest with what the scriptures tell us, it gets even a little bit more worse for us. The scripture actually tells us, it defines us by everything that God hates. I don't know if you've ever thought about this before, but when we were in our sin, as we are living in sin, we are doing everything that is opposed to God. So much so that Ephesians tells us that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Following the course of this world order, carrying out the desires of the body and of the flesh. Ephesians, Paul says even more, he goes, by your own actions, you have become children of wrath. So listen, if we are honest with ourselves and we evaluate our lives on the basis and the foundation of scripture, we plainly see that there was nothing in me that has compelled God to look down and say, I love you. How does that make you feel? You have some questions, don't you? Why? What, 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 what's going on here? So John says, in spite of all of this, in spite of your characteristics, the way that you're living life right now, you need to understand that the love that God has towards you is not based in you, but it's based solely upon who God is. Catch this, God loves you because he's simply love. This means that God's love for us isn't based on our performance. Listen, stop trying to live your life in such a way where it earns you God's love. 
It's not based upon your performance. It's not based upon how well you're doing in life right now. It's not based upon how well you're going to handle rush hour traffic in the morning. It's not going to matter. Your love for God isn't based upon how well you're going to handle all the crazy crowds as you're shopping this week. God's love for you, it isn't based upon your behavior. It is based solely upon him being love himself. The text tells us we are loved because he is love. And the incredible thing about God and him showing his love for us, it's we, we have a God that is going to put love into action here. What I'm saying is that the incredible thing about God's love, it doesn't stay dormant. God's love doesn't stay out there in the ethereal realm where it's just a simple declaration of, I love you. But he's going to put love into action. He's going to say, love is going to be made visible in Jesus. Look at the text again, verse nine. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his son into the world so that we might live through him. In this love, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So we've seen that love has its source in God, but John continues and he says, love is made visible in Jesus. Love is made visible in Jesus. As we were planning this series um, several months ago now, I knew that week three this week would be on the theme of love. So in preparation to all of this, I was being a good student of the Bible, right? I was actually reading the Bible, which is a good thing, right? So I was reading my way through the Gospels and I read through um, Matthew's account of the birth narratives and Luke's account of the birth narratives. And then after we get done researching all of that, I turned over to Mark. And while Mark doesn't have necessarily an account of Jesus' coming in the form of a baby, what it does show us is John the Baptist preparing the way for the Messiah. And then in John, John takes a little more of a theological approach with him, him talking more about the incarnation of God becoming man and I was doing all this research and then I found something kind of odd. Something seemed to be missing. Our, our theme is love. This week is all about love but do you know how many times the biblical authors mention love in the coming of Jesus Christ in the, in the gospels? Zero. Zero. Now does that mean that the love of God isn't present in the coming of Jesus? Well certainly not. Certainly not. The entire point of the scriptures, what it's pointing us to is that love is the driving force, the motivation of sending Jesus to be with us. That's what verse nine says, doesn't it? In this, the love of God was made manifest. The love of God was made seen. It was made visible. It was made known in which way that he sent his son into the world so that we might live through him. Church, may I remind you this morning that the Christian God, the God of the Bible, he's not just a talking God. No, no, he's a doing God. He is a serving God. He is an acting God. He doesn't just say stuff high in the sky, but yet he comes down and makes himself low and he makes his love known to us. So listen, if you come in here this morning and you know that you're broken, you know that you have deep pains and hurts within you. And you're asking the question, does anybody love me? Whether you feel abandoned or betrayed or lied to, you feel mistreated, something has happened to you that's harmed you in the past and you're sitting there asking the question, does anybody love me? Will anybody ever love me? The good news of the gospel answers that question with a resounding yes. Yes, Jesus loves you. God loves you. And he wants to shower and pour out his love upon you this morning. And yet you're still sitting there, you're asking the question, well, how can I know that he loves me? I hear what you're saying, but how can I know? Give me some evidence from life that shows me God's love. John seems to see that, that, that question in the text. Two times he's gonna repeat himself. So this is how you know the love of God, that he sent his son into the world. He's gonna show it to us in two ways. How do you know the love of God? That he sent his son in two ways. First in the cradle. We're gonna see the love of God with God becoming man, born in the stable in Bethlehem. You're gonna see it in the cradle, but then he's gonna fast forward and he's gonna look to the cross. 
Church, listen, the cradle is forever connected to the cross for the purpose of showing us God's unfathomable love towards you. This is the preeminent manifestation of God's love, that he sent his son into the world, his only son, the text says, so that we might live through him. That sounds a lot like John 3, 16, doesn't it? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him wouldn't perish but had everlasting life. This is how you know that God sent his son. God sent his son from heaven. Oh, get, get your mind around this this morning. God sent his only son from heaven who had existed eternally with the Father and with the Son in perfect community, in perfect communion with one another. God was not lonely in heaven and that's why he sent his Son into the world. No, the triune God of the scriptures, they have existed, he has existed eternally in heaven in perfect fellowship, communion, and community with one another. God was not lonely in heaven. No, he was loving and that's why he sent his Son. He sent his son into enemy territory full of sinners like you and me on a search and rescue mission to find and to purpose to die on the cross for you and for me. He came looking for us even when we didn't have the ability to look for him. Why did he come? The text says that we might live through him. The purpose of Jesus' coming is that we might live through him, the text says. That phrase in verse nine, it, it, it has connotations of, of living life in God. That we'd be born again, having new life in Christ Jesus. It means to experience his love and his grace and forgiveness. It is to experience his fellowship between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. To live through him, it means to, to walk in the light. To walk and to do as Jesus has done. To have life through him is to repent of our sins, to confess them, to trust in Jesus as our savior. To live through him is what gives us confidence on the last day when Christ returns and he gathers his church together that we will be with him for we have confidence that he has defeated death, sin, and the grave once and for all. To live life through him is the life that we all long for. It's what your soul is craving for. And nothing else in life will be able to satisfy the cravings of your soul other than to find life in Jesus. This is why Jesus came. This is why he stepped out of the perfection of heaven, wrapped himself up into human flesh and subjected himself to a life here on earth. He came to give you life. This is how love is made visible. Look to the cradle. Look to the cradle and see love, but then sprint to the cross and see love as well. John says here in verse 10, he adds to it, and he says, love is made visible in Jesus' sacrifice. Love is made visible in sacrifice. Verse 10 says, in this love, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us. And he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Of all of the verses in the scriptures, church, verse 10 may be the most important one. This shows God's initiative, his action to love us even when we were unable to love him because of our sin and rebellion that we had committed against him. This is the context in which love becomes visible that God does the unthinkable. The creator God, after being rejected by his own creation, who could have just destroyed it all and started over again, but yet out of the compassion and love in his heart, decides, I am going to write myself into this story. I am going to be the savior of mankind. I'm going to go and I'm going to lay my life down for them. This is love. There's a really important word in verse 10. Propitiation. Can everybody say that word with me for a minute? Propitiation. Difficult word, isn't it? Listen, I want you to understand that just because it's a big word and maybe unusual to you, unsure how this is used in this verse, I want you to understand it doesn't mean that it's a hard concept to grasp. It's kind of like trying to figure out how to order at Starbucks. You guys done that before? All right, listen, growing up in a small town in the foothills of North Carolina, we didn't have Starbucks. 
We didn't have local coffee shops. So my knowledge and understanding of coffee was incredibly limited. Limited to, I knew Folgers was the brand and my dad made it in the morning, it was hot and we drank it with a little bit of half and half. That was it. But it wasn't until college that my world really got turned upside down in this whole coffee scene. I started dating this city girl from Colorado named Chelsea. And she was all the time drinking the Starbucks coffee. So as we began dating, we, she goes, let me, let me take it to Starbucks. I'm like, okay, I like coffee. So I go, I'm pretty confident that I'm gonna just stand up there and order my Folgers coffee and we're gonna have a good day, right? But as I'm standing there in line, I begin to get nervous. My, my hands start sweating. I'm completely out of my comfort zone, why? Because I'm looking at this menu, I'm looking at this screen and I see words that I've never seen before. I don't even know how to pronounce half of these things. There's a frappuccino and a macchiato and a cappuccino and an Americano all made with espresso. And then you have these lattes. And you know why they're called lattes, by the way? Because they cost a latte. <laughs> thanks, thanks. That joke for the win. Listen, here's what I found out. Just because it had a big word that I was un unsure of how it was being used. I had no idea what this meant. It didn't really mean that it was hard to understand what I was ordering. What I'm saying is if you can figure out how to order a drink from Starbucks, you can figure out how, to, how some of these theological words are used in, in Scripture. John says, that, John says that Jesus, he's the propitiation for our sins. What does that word mean? What does propitiation mean? At a very base level, it means appeasement or satisfaction. In other words, the claim that was against you has been satisfied. And we know this in our own worlds. If you've ever been in a traffic accident and it was your fault and you caused some damage to a person's car, they have a claim against you. You are liable to pay the full, full weight of your damages due to them. And when you pay your debt, they have been propitiated. They have been satisfied, appeased. Your debt has been paid. So John is saying here, Jesus is our propitiation. What does that mean? that Jesus absorbed all of God's wrath on the cross in my place. That Jesus absorbed all of God's wrath towards sin in my place. That God has accepted Jesus' payment for sin on the cross by being my substitute, my wrath bearer, on the cross, that's what propitiation means. To get a better understanding of this, we need to understand that God, he's a holy, righteous, and just God, and by his own character, by his own nature, he is obligated to punish what is sinful. He must punish sin and sinners. This is really bad news for us because scripture tells us that we are all sinners and we have all messed up in our lives, we've fallen short of God's perfect standards of righteousness. And the thing about it, it doesn't really matter how much you sin. It doesn't matter what types of sin you're into. It does not matter what sins you have given yourself over to in life. Scripture, it levels the playing field. It calls us all by one name, sinner. And because we are sinners, we are separated from a relationship with God. And now we have a death sentence hanging over our head where we will be the objects of God's wrath. We will endure all of the just penalty for our sins. That's what scripture is telling us. God, he's a holy, righteous, and just judge. He will do what is right. See, the Christian God, the God of the Bible, he can't just ignore sin and act like it's not there. Our, our, our God, he can't just sweep sin underneath the rug and act like it's not there. He's a good and righteous judge. And that means he must punish what is sinful. Good judges do not let guilty people go free. We know this. In our society, we have great value on good and just judges. A good and just judge doesn't go, well, he's clearly guilty, but he's really sorry about his actions. You're free to go. 
No, God is good and his goodness hangs in the balance of him doing what is right. And what him doing right in this scenario is punishing sin and those that commit sin. Linus, that doesn't sound very loving. No, love's not seen there. Love is seen in him sending his son to be your substitute on the cross. Love is what propelled God to send his only son into this world to live the life that we couldn't live and die the death that we deserved. Love is seen in Jesus's sacrifice. Jesus on the cross hung there in our place, absorbing all of God's punishment towards me, all of God's wrath towards me, all of the condemnation that was due to me was placed onto Jesus on the cross. And as he was enduring that, as he finished it, he let out with a loud cry, it is finished. Why? Because he has taken all of our sin and condemnation upon himself. Church, this means for us that we are no longer in condemnation. It means that that there's not a single drop, not a single ounce of God's anger towards sin heading your direction. Why? Because all of God's fierce anger towards sin was poured out onto Jesus and he took it all onto himself and he said, paid in full. Do you see it, church? Do you see this love? That God's love was made visible to us, not in just Jesus' coming to live a life that, that we were unable to live, a life free of sin and free from corruption, but love is also seen at the cross where Jesus took on all of our sin punishment for us. It was due to me. I deserved that. A king dying in the place of his traitors. The creator God dying in the place for his creation. The beloved lover sacrificing himself for the sake of his betrayer. What kind of love must this be? What kind of love must this be? God loving us to the point of his own son's death on the cross? Do not become numb to that, church. Don't be so callous when it comes to the love of God. Him extending salvation to people that didn't deserve it? We didn't earn God's love. We didn't deserve God's love. He didn't need to save us. No, no, but he wanted us. He wanted us. He wanted us to know him as a good and loving father that loves us even to great personal cost to himself. Ephesians 2 puts it this way, but God being rich in mercy and with the great love in which he has loved us with, even while we were dead in our trespasses and sins, made us alive together in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you were saved. You wanna see God's love for you? Look to the cross. Romans 5, 8 says that God showed his love towards us in this way, that while we were still sinners, while we were still rebels, while we didn't earn or deserve this, but that God sent his son Jesus to die in our place. Christ died for us. Have you experienced this love? Have you reached out your hands and laid a hold of the gospel and received this love? Have you embraced it? Is it it yours? Have you been changed by this love? Maybe a better question, are you living right now in this type of love? Is your life characterized by this type of love? Well, Linus, how do I know? How do I know if I've received this love? I I hear you, that that love was made seen in Jesus. I see it in the cradle, I see it in the cross. I know that it has its source in God, but how do I know if I have received this love? What evidence should there be? Verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, We ought to love one another. How do you know if you have received the love of God in your life? John is giving us a simple test here. He says, look to your life, look to the actions of your life and compare it under the weight of scripture. Ask the question, how are you loving others? 
How am I doing in the category of loving others? You see, John is making an argument here. He says, love compels us to love. Love compels us to love. If we were to paraphrase this verse, I think it would go something like this. If God loves us in this way, and he does, just look to the cradle and to the cross, he loves you in that way, then we ought to naturally, out of gospel gratitude in our heart, and now being connected to the very source of love himself, ought to love others. You see John's argument. If God is love, and the pinnacle of God's love towards us is the sacrifice of Jesus then those that have received this love will be marked by a self-sacrificial love themselves. That's how you know. Look to your life. How would the actions of your life demand you answer this? This is love, giving yourself over to another, loving to the point of great personal cost and expense yourself. This is God's desire for his people, for his church, that we would be marked by this kind of love. Oh, that we'd be a people marked by self-sacrifice. If love is seen in sacrifice, then those that have experienced this love will be self-sacrificial types of people. Not just the people that we like. Not just the people that are like us. Not just the people that we have things in common with. Not just limited to those people of the same political persuasion as us. Not just limited to the same race of people. Not just limited to the same nationality, but that we would love all people this way. Our church should be the central, the focal point of this love, shouldn't it? That people all over this room that confess Jesus Christ as their savior, claiming that they have received this type of love in their life, then we should be the most self-sacrificing, loving group of people imaginable. And we should be a people loved deeply by God. And because we are loved deeply by God, we love deeply others. People that are marked by sacrificing for one another in this place. Let us be a church that is known by our incredible love towards God because we understand of the great love in which he has loved us with. Because we understand that God is love and he has loved us, then we ought to love one another. Other translations will say, you must love one another. Because God has been gracious to me, I can be gracious to other people. Because God has been merciful to me, I can be merciful to other people. Because God has loved me, I can love others. And that starts right here in this household of faith called Riverside. And only then does it spill out into our neighborhoods, into our communities, into our workplace. This is God's desire for us. So how are you loving today? How are you loving? Are you laying your life down for the sake of others? You see, a life filled with love will be marked by sacrifice. Catch this. Loving like Jesus has loved you will cost you everything. It costs Jesus his life. It will cost us our lives to love to in the same way and to the same extent as he has loved us. No one's acting like this is easy. But what John is saying, it is the natural overflow of a life that has been radically changed by the love of God. And when we get a picture of the love of God in our lives and we understand the great salvation that we have in Christ Jesus, we can't help but to give our our lives away to other people. We can't help but to be motivated to proclaim the gospels in all parts of the world because we understand that they are no better than us apart from Christ. And because we have been changed, we want them to be changed. Because we have received the love of God, we want them to receive the love of God. We understand of the great magnitude of which God has loved us. When we get a a glimpse of this, we understand that in this short momentary span that we have here in life, it is worth it in comparison to having everlasting life with our Father. So we give ourselves away in this life. I guess what I'm trying to say is that it's inconceivable 
for us to get hit by the power and the force of God's love for us and that not result in us being loving people ourselves. On Friday, I was driving into work. I needed to gather some stuff around for this weekend and um, getting on the interstate, noticed I had a flat tire. So here we go again, right? So I pull over on I-25, start the process, takes a few minutes, get the first tire off, set it beside me, about to put the other, uh, other spare tire on. And when i just about to put the other spare tire on, my, my foot slips and knocks the, the flat tire out in the middle of the interstate. So without even thinking, I go and I pick up the, pick up the tire and I'm like, well, now what do I do? I'm in the middle of the interstate. Transfer truck coming 75 miles an hour, right there on me, honks his horn, boom, boom, hits me. I go flying, tire goes flying. Apparently he didn't know what he hit, so he stopped the truck, put it in reverse, and he runs over me again. What do you say to such a story? You say, you're a liar. You're a liar, why? Because if you actually got hit by a transfer truck that's going 75 miles an hour, you'd look different. You'd walk a little differently, probably talk a little bit different. Everything about you would be different. John is saying that it is unfathomable that we could get hit with just one ounce of God's love towards us and that not result in us becoming loving people ourselves. Are you changed by this love? Has it compelled you to love others? Evaluate your life. What would your life demand you answer? Because if you answer the yes to this question, have you accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life? Then you should be able to look to your life and see evidences of you loving other people the way Christ has loved you. And if you're sitting in here this morning, you're hearing me and you're like, Landis, I'm not trying to be prideful or anything, but I can look to my life and I think I am loving people the way Christ would want me to, to love. I'm loving to the best of my ability. For us that are in that category, I think John would say this to us. He would encourage us. He would say, continue, continue to love, continue to lay your life down for the sake of others. Continue to submit yourself under the work of the Holy Spirit. Continue to be changed yourself and show my love to the world. Continue in that. For others of us, if we may be in a little more of a a category of tension here that we would say, well, Landis, I, I, I do confess Jesus as my savior. I, I do believe that I have received this love, but I'm looking to my life and it seems like my love for others is, is lagging. For us that are in that category, listen, don't let this plunder you into despair. You could be asking the question, well, how do I know when I've loved enough? How do I know when is enough? How much love is, should, be, should, should I, I be seen in, in my life? Listen, don't go into despair. The basis of your salvation is not based upon how much you love, but it's based solely upon how much God has loved you. And he shows that in his son's sacrificial death on the cross on your behalf. So for us that are in that category, and let us evaluate our lives. Let us confess sin where sin is present. Let us repent of our sin and let's continue chasing after Jesus, submitting ourselves unto his work, being shaped and molded into the image of his son where we will be changed. And the more that we are linked to Jesus in our lives, the more he will work in our lives and the more that love in our hearts should be growing. Let's do the hard work of confession and repentance, running back to Jesus, the very source of love himself, and watch your love for others begin to grow. Yeah, for others of us, and I'm gonna close in this, maybe you, you know right now that you have never received this love of God. But yet you see it. You see it in, in the scriptures. In your heart, you know that God loves you and you want to receive that love today. 
If that is you, hear the gospel one more time. You were created by God to have a relationship with himself. But your own sin and rebellion has separated you from that relationship. And you had a death sentence hanging over your head because of your own sin and rebellion. But the good news of the gospel says that God has sent his son Jesus to be your substitute on the cross, that Jesus took on all of your sin and your shame, all of your condemnation on the cross, and he bore the full weight of that under God's punishment. He died on the cross for you. But according to the scriptures, they tell us that three days later, he rose again, securing in, yourself, or in himself your salvation, your eternal and new life in him. Do you believe that gospel? Do you believe that gospel? Do you want to receive this love from God? And if the answer is yes, that's really simple. Just tell him right here, maybe in the quietness of your own heart and mind, say, I receive your love. I, I trust in you, Jesus. Thank you for loving me. As the band comes up and they begin to, to lead us in one song of response, if that's you, if you want to receive Jesus or if you just told him that, that I trust you right now in this moment, I want you to know that you have the freedom to move during this last song. You have the freedom to come and tell some of the ministers that will be up here on, at the front that I have just accepted God's love for me. But if that's uncomfortable for you, you don't want to do that, that's okay. Come see us after church. We're going to be hanging out down here. The most important thing for you is as we sing this song, that you trust in Jesus. Trust in Jesus. Reach out your hand and take a hold of God's love for you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. And well, this morning it seems like yeah, you've directed us to look to our lives. You've shown us really how great of a sinner that we are. But at the same time, we got a great picture of how great of a loving God you are as well. This morning, we come to you with great gratitude that you would love us even when we were unlovable, when we didn't deserve your love. And that you showed us your love in the giving of your son to be the savior of our souls. So help us now as we receive this love from you to go out from this place and love others in the same way and to the same extent as you have loved us. Or it's in your name I pray, amen.